Thank you very much for staying, uh, after, especially after a long yet informative and inspiring day. And I would very much like to continue the conversations between the guest speakers and the audience. So the format for this round table would be the questions. We are taking questions from the audience and then guest speakers will respond. And in the end of this round table, uh, I would like to invite Professor Norma Field to speak to us because um, as we all witnessed, she, was she did an amazing job at representing others' voices. Yet, yet, we have not heard her own voice. So I would like to turn uh, our mic to her in the end of the uh, question and answer session. Okay, so shall we, shall we get started? My question's about the uh, cleanup workers there. And I was wondering if you knew, could elaborate on their working conditions and if they're being protected from radiation and if they're being properly chained to prepare for high doses of radiation. え、え、そのためにただし、え、私もそうだし、原子力発電所で働く労働者 でしょうし、皆さんだってそうだと思うけれども、被爆をしたいと思う人間はいないのですね。被爆労働はできるだけしたくないと思うわけですから、原子力発電所で働いて本当に被爆をしているのは下請け労働者です。そして日本政府の公
いたのかもしれないし、今でもいるのかもしれないと私は思っています。以上です。There's a well known phenomenon in the nuclear industry called jumping or jumpers. And、uh, so a nuclear worker will reach their limit of radiation at one plant and they quit and leave and go to another plant. And no, there's no transfer of the information, the radiation information from one to another. The same is true in hospitals. Doctors who keep track of how much radiation they have doing cardiac casts and whatnot, the hospital closes or they move to another facility and there's no transfer of that radiation to the other facility. In Chernobyl,、uh, there were between 700,000 and 800,000、uh, cleanup workers, liquidators. And、uh, one of my、uh, friends who was in Chernobyl was a radiation physicist. And his job was to measure how much radiation was in different areas and tell the workers how long they could be in a spot working before they reached their limit of radiation. And you see some of the movies, these guys rush across the roof, they pick up or scoop up a, something and rush back, and they're done. And、um, he said that it was quite common for these conscripts who were largely from the Eastern Soviet Union, young soldiers and whatnot,、uh, to take their masks off and just sleep in the grass.、Um, and then he went back to the Ukraine to find out what records had been kept on the radiation that these people got,、uh, which was done through radiation badges.、Um, and all of the records had disappeared. And from the institute that he worked in in the Ukraine. And why he wanted to find out is he wanted to find out how much radiation he'd gotten. And he has no idea because his records were gone as well. And so at the fall of the wall, either they just disappeared or they were taken to Moscow and they're buried somewhere so that we don't have to follow these people and we don't know how much radiation they got. When I was in Chernobyl,、uh, I saw people plowing fields there. They weren't wearing respirators, dust masks, or anything, and they were scraping dirt off that's radioactive. They bury it and then they put sand over it. And I said to my guide, how, are you, how do you measure what these workers are getting? And he said, Oh, they all have radiation badges. And I said, Really? I said, Where's yours? And he opened his coat and he said, Hmm, I guess I left it at home in my other coat today. <laughs> so you can take what you wish from that. And I, I'm, I'm going to add something too that, that if you. If you took a job at a plant and you knew that your job lasted until you reached a limit on your dosimeter, we've seen where those dosimeters can be hidden.、Uh, and a worker would go into work in an area and come out and pick up the dosimeter so that he could stay on the job longer. パトラソン先生からもその放射の漏れの話がありましたけれども、一体どれぐらいの。ものが出ているのか、その日常的にということを伺いたいと思いました。この会場にいらっしゃる皆さんも、原子力発電所というのは、事故が起きたから大変なんだ、事故が事故を起こすから危険なんだと思っている方が多いんだと思いますし、それはもちろん本当のことですけれども、原子力発電所というものは、事故を起こさなくても、放射能を必ず外に。放出しなければ運転できないというそういう機械です。福島の写真も皆さん何度もご覧になったと思いますし、私も今日見ていただきましたけれども、あの写真には巨大な煙突が写っていました。あの煙突からは日常的に放射能が流されているというそういうものです。そして液体の放射性物質は原子炉を冷やすための冷却水の一部に混ぜられて海あるいは米国の場合は川に流されるということになってきてきました私はそういう日常的に環境に放出される放射性物質がどの程度原子力発電所の周辺を汚しているかということをあの長年測ってきた経験をがありますただしあ経験がありますし日本の政府あるいは電力会社も、えー、この年のこの原子力発電所は期待に煙突からどれだけの放射能をそして海へどれだけの放射能を流したというデータを一応は公表してきました
そしてもちろん放出されてるわけですから私たちの方でそれを検出したいと思って検出したいという気持ちを持ってそれなりの仕方を,を考えて測定をすればその汚染は検出できます日本でも検出原子力発電所の周辺で検出できました多分米国でもそういう検出された例というのはた,たくさんあるんだろうと私は思いますディーンさんに聞いた方がいいかもしれませんけれどもた,ただし、えー、今まで私が検出して,してきた原子力発電所の環境周辺の環境の汚染というのは大変レベルの低いもので、えー、日本の原子力発電所の周辺で仮に被害が出たとしてもそれを被害として見つけ出すと疫学的という私たち言葉を使いますけれどもそうやって見つけ出すことは多分私はできないだろうと思いながら今まで来ましたしかし去年の事故が起きて、えー、福島第一原子力発電所から300キロも400キロも離れているところに、えー私が、まあ、日本では東通りと呼んでいる原子力発電所があって私は10年ほど前からそこ,のそこの周辺の汚染を調べているのですが福島の事故が起きた途端にそこの周辺の汚染が桁違いに増えました何百キロも離れたところまで今回の事故の影響がいっぺんに出てくるということになりましたそのため私は本当に今回の福島の事故というのは大変な事故だったんだなということを改めて知ることになりましたし世界中の皆さんに放射能をばらまいてしまったということに対して大変申し訳なく思っています事故というのはやはりどうしても防がなければいけないでもご質問のとおり平常運転時でも放射能が出ているということは皆さん心に留めておいてほしいと思います。あとはディーンさんがもし何かご存知ならばと。So the studies on the effects of、uh, cancer around nuclear power plants have been quite mixed. An earlier study in the United States showed no effect whatsoever. And、um, the National Academy of Sciences is currently gone through a phase one of developing a much more comprehensive and second study because the first study was、um, criticized fairly heavily on methodological grounds. Um, and the, their、uh, phase one proposal or report is huge. And、uh, to do the study is going to cost a lot of money, take a lot of time, and be very expensive to do. Two studies in Europe,、uh, one in Germany, and I think the other was in France or Belgium, did show、uh, increased cancer rates、uh, around nuclear power plants. So, again,、uh, past studies have been mixed on this. I have mixed feelings about、uh, the National Academy of Sciences spending this much time and money doing this、uh, when I know that radiation is not good for us. I'm not sure that、uh, this is really going to prove anything, and we may end up arguing once again how many angels dance on the head of a pin here. I have, for me, a very worrying issue to address.、Um, We have seen、um, how much cesium got spread even to the West Coast and to the United States because of Fukushima. And we know from the reactor number one in Fukushima that、um, yeah, the loads of fuel it was already at its end of its lifespan. It was very close to get recharged again. And when fuel rods are being used, they produ、uh, produce plutonium. So they have 1% plutonium in them. That's why afterwards they go into the so called reprocessing plant,、uh, plutonium fabric, where it's been taken out for weapons or other stuff.、Um, this, the other thing is the MOX fuel in the second reactor.、Um, we know there was MOX fuel inside,、um, and MOX fuel contains 4%. Uh, 4 Percent of plutonium when it's new, it produces even more as long as it is inside. So,、uh, we calculated that in only the three ones which、uh, melted, exploded, whatever, it must be about 300 kilo of plutonium, which is a lot when you know that this is the deadliest thing and that、uh, yeah, one millionth of a gram can cause、uh, cancer or <coughs> causes cancer. If you inhale it or ingest it or whatever. So, and it's also an alpha emitter, which means it's very difficult to, to detect comparing to cesium,、uh, which is better.、Um, so, actually, my question is also to the doctor、um, 
what does it actually mean, 300 kilogram plutonium somehow being released partly into the ocean for the, uh, yeah, for the ocean life uh, arriving through the air, through the jet stream to the, towards the United States for the local workers, for the local population. Um, yeah, and what do you think about uh, this issue? Because, for, for example, in Germany, uh, we have the nine nuclear reactors operating and they all run one third with MOX fuel too. Um, and okay, I stop here. Thanks. <laughs> It's very interesting that when uh, Chernobyl went up, uh, a group of us met with uh, about a month afterwards when we were in the area uh, with a f very famous physicist who was involved with the building of the bomb and et cetera. And he said, oh, no plutonium came out of Chernobyl. It didn't get hot enough to do it. Uh, but that was not true. He was wrong about that. Um, plutonium did come out of Chernobyl. And plutonium has come out of... Fukushima, and I'll be interested to hear uh, the comments about that. I don't know how far the plutonium has gone. Uh, it's hot particles uh, that are they're larger particles. Uh, clearly, plutonium is uh, a bad actor if it gets in your lungs, lodges in your lungs, can stay there uh, forever, can go into your spleen, into your um, uh, kidneys, uh, and if there's enough, can cause uh, kidney failure. Um, so uh, I don't think we have good uh, data at this point. And perhaps um, you can talk about how far plutonium has been measured out of the plant. Uh, I'd like to add one thing here just for a minute. On sampling, we found in our studies that I, I believe I have very little concept, confidence in any sampling values that's been done at the, at the facilities. Uh, we've seen cases where they've given us temperatures, but the temperature elements that they're using have gone through severe accidents. And so we question the integrity of the instruments that they're using to try and make the measurements. Uh, as far as going in and taking air samples, they have the technology to do that, but we don't trust the data that we're seeing. And it's hard to calculate what that data is supposed to be based on the complexity of the accident. The water sampling they do in the canals to try and find out what's going on in there is the same way. And so what I, what I have a problem with, I, don't, I can't place any trust in what I see. A lot of times we were looking for maybe at least a trend in something. If the data is wrong, at least a trend up and down. And a lot of times you'd be looking at an instrument and you'd be relying on that data and all of a sudden that instrument would start spiking up and down because it was failing. And so the, it's very difficult to get accurate data from instruments that are in the plant and the data that they're going in to get is it's hard to place confidence in the accuracy of the data. え、私の知ってることをお答えしようと思いますが、え、プルトニウムが放出された割合は事故ただし、どれ
かなり少ないと私は今は思っています。えー、セシウム137の放出量に比べると多分100万分の1ぐらいです。プルトニウムは確かに人類が遭遇した毒物のうちでも最強の毒物と言われるほどの毒物ですからもちろん注意はしなければいけませんけれどもそれでも福島の事故で放出された放射能で一番注意をしなければいけないものはやはり私はセシウム137だと思いますもしあの他のパデラの方で何かご意見があれば One thing I'd like to add is that the calculations that are made to try and track plumes are extremely complex and the first thing that is asked is what was the source term of the accident and in the case of Fukushima they don't know what the source term is they can't accurately tell the people that are trying to do the calculations to figure out how far should we evacuate where is this uh, going where's the plume going And so the first thing right out of the gate on this accident is the people that were trying to get the information couldn't get it. They didn't know what it was. And when they tried to ask, the question, the, the question wasn't answered. So they were left with something like, what do we do, assume something? Now, sometimes uh, the person doing the analysis may, be, may assume that the total source term, everything was, was blown up and everything gets out of the facility. And in those cases, many times, the people in the government say, we can't deal with that. That is too high. That evacuation zone would be so big that it doesn't make sense. And so somewhere between the extreme and reality uh, lies the question mark. And so, uh, for instance, when I was asked early on in the accident what I thought the evacuation zones would be, I, I thought about it. I thought about what could happen in the reactors and what could happen in the accidents without any scientific analysis or anything like that. And I said 150 kilometers. And so I, I stuck with that. And uh, you know, later on we found out they went out to five and then to 10 and then to 20 and then the United States went out to 50. And they're wondering now, can we bring people back in? Certainly not until they get the fuel out of all those spent fuel pools. And when they do that, they may need to consider taking that boundary out further because the accident potential in the spent fuel pools is real and it's very delicate taking all of the components out of the water, trying to make things safe enough so they can go and do this examination on it. And there could be another earthquake that could upset that. Components could fall into the canal and cause other problems. So I think they need to reevaluate where they're at right now.、Uh, so far, we have three questions from the floor, and I am very sorry that I, we cannot take more questions. Sorry. Hate me.、Um, so、uh, I have a favor to ask you. Please make your question be concise and ask one question. Thank you. Uh, my question actually is a, is a little bit of a shift、um, about、uh, the sort of sociological and cultural、um, context of this. So、um, it seems to me that the issue of transparency、um, has been、uh, really important、um, in understanding Fukushima, but also,、um, as Professor、um, Koeda had mentioned earlier,、um, in, in certain ways covering up、uh, the Japanese government's intentions to proliferate. Um, and so I'm just really interested in,、um, in hearing your take on the, the relationship between Hiroshima and Nagasaki as、um, events、um, of、uh, catastrophic proportions that also have left a, a,、um, a, cult, a traumatic imprint、um, you know, upon、uh, the culture of Japan and how this may have、um, affected、uh, the ways in which the government has.、Um, Foreign policy and,、um, and kind of,、uh, you know, not been avoided transparency about,、um, you know, about、uh, nuclear risk as well as intentions to、uh, proliferate weapons. This is a very important thing to do with the people who are living in the world. The people who are living in the world are living in the world. The people who are living in the world are living in the world. The people who are living in the world are living in the world. 原子力が平和利用
ていうことに使われることにあの対して、えー、の今までその自分たちが受けたものがとてもあの良いものに使われるということで自分たちもその差別されてきた汚名を晴らすことができるというそういう感覚になったというふうに聞いていますそこをうまく利用されたっていうのはあるのではないかと思います。I'd like to talk about、uh, secrecy and x l a y Our house is seven miles、uh, northwest from seventy、uh, miles, sorry,、uh, northeast from Byron. Nuclear plant. This year,、uh, already two times an accident h a v e happened in Byron. At that time, local media was very, very quiet. Actually, I found the news at、uh, first、uh, through the internet of a Japanese site.、Uh, local TV said a small amount of tritium has released from vent from Byron nuclear plant, but not harmful to human. Uh, this is the same sentence which I've heard a lot when it happened in Fukushima.、Uh, also, lo local newspaper I found that put the news not first page but third. It was a very small article. So I just asked our neighbors, but、uh, seems nobody c a r e about it. This subject. So I was very disappointed. Also, for the、uh, x l a y when I visited my dentist every six months for the regular checkup, he t a k e x l a y every time. So I asked him, Is this okay for me?、Uh, he said, Of course. This is just a small amount. Sure, sure, sure. I don't mean to be rude, but you asked for it. Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, so radiation, he said, it's、uh, such a very small amount, and so don't worry about it. And、uh, this is a question to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Patterson.、Oh, what do you think about?、Uh, I'll just say something about x rays. I haven't had one of those big plates in a long time. It's all about money there, too. It's very, very expensive. If you have a problem, obviously, with the tooth, And you need an x ray, I believe that you have one taken. But to do it routinely,、um, I'm a doctor's daughter, I'm not a doctor, but、um, I certainly haven't had x rays in、um, about 10 years. I think、uh, one needs to weigh in the balance the,、uh, the benefits versus the risks of any medical x rays. And I think that when it's indicated you've got an injury,、uh, you've got some undiagnosed condition,、uh, I think one should not hesitate、uh, to have x rays taken.、Um, I certainly ordered them and use them all the time, and they're very useful. So I think we have to weigh that in the balance.、Uh, but I think we also have to be a bit circumspect with our provider in saying, do we really need this done? I have patients who come in and I say, you know, I've I think you've just sprained your ankle, and you know, well, I want an x ray. I want to know for sure. And it's not necessary to do that. You know, you can be on it for a few days. If it doesn't get better, why we can x ray it.、Um, so there are things like that that I think we can use、uh, a little more judgment about.、Uh, but I, I, wouldn't, I don't want people to go away and say, gosh, I should never have x rays. I, you know, if you need them, you need them. And, Uh, they're very, very beneficial in many, many ways. So we have to weigh the risk versus the, the benefit.、Um, the dental x ray issue. And the other issue is that the same x rays in different institutions or in the same hospital, for example, I did a study on CAT scans, and the same CAT scan in the same hospital had a varying amount of radiation of, of 13 times. Uh, so, you know, these are some of the, the vagaries and the things that occur. Uh, with radiation. I think it's getting better. There's more standardization.、Uh, but certainly,、uh, this, this has been a problem in terms of medical radiation. You will never hear a release from a nuclear power plant, and you'll never hear them say, This is a really bad release, okay? This is going to hurt a lot of people, all right? I just wanted to share something. I was reading an article by a professor of anthropology from,、uh, I believe it was Penn State. and Uh, she had gone over to Chernobyl and she just was visiting a, a medical facility. 
And there was a lady there with her daughter, and her daughter was uh, having problems with thyroid. And so she was going to have to have a thyroid surgery. And one thing that the, the uh, professor noticed is that she looked at her mother, and her mother had the same scar. And so it had gone through her mother's generation down to her. Additionally, what she was also saying is that the people in Japan have had three unprecedented disasters. And she said it's very difficult to come up with the metrics to measure what the impact is on the people in Japan because of the severity and, and the complexity of what's happened to them. I know Chicago からもですね、あの非常にこの震災で、あのかなりの資金とかですね、ヘルプしまして、もうこれはもう世界からやったんだろうと思いますけども、あの実際にはあのどういうふうにこうなってるのか、あの我々資金を出したところもですね、わからないんです。で、まああのニュースやなんかでもですね。あ,のあまりそういうところが出てませんしただただ単にですね武藤さんがおっしゃってるようにその資金的に困ってる方もいるということなんですけども実際にこの世界からですねあの石中自社を通したりいろんな資金が回ってると思うんですけどもそれが実際に日本の政府がですね、えー、実際に被害があった方々にですね回ってるのか。その辺がちょっと知りたかったんですけども、あのもしご存知でしたら教えてください。えっ、ー、と実際あの福島県の場合ですと、えー、被害被害というかその避難区域に当たっている人ですね。えー、国から決められたあの避難区域30キロ圏内までの人たちには見舞い金としてお金があの配られています。で金額はちょっとその場所によってちょっと違うのかもしれないのでちょっと私は分からないんですけれどもうんと一人に対してえっと100万円だったかなえっと100万円ぐらいかなあのその場所によってちょっと違うのかもしれませんえそのぐらいの金額があの配られていると思いますそして津波のところでもやはりあの家の流れた人とかあの壊れた人、そういう人たちには支援金としてお金が配られていると思います。でも全額が配られているかどうかはあのわかりません。そしてあの福島の場合だと避難区域以外のところであのホッ,ホットスポット高い線量のあるところの方々がいるんですけど、その方々があの。自主的に避難しているんですね。そういう方々に対しての見舞い金というのはないと思います。Is the question whether the money is getting to the people? Yes. I think as an activist, all of us in this room, if we have affairs, we can、uh, talks or anything. This is what we've done in Atlanta to, to raise money for, to relocate. We only raised about $500, but we sent it to Green Action to Eileen Miyoko Smith over there to help. If we could help one family for one week, it's something. But I think this is the way we have to keep it in the media because since March 11th, it's dropped off. And so we really need at every, at every point to be writing letters to the editor, to be talking to people, to bringing it up in our churches and our schools and, and keeping it alive rather than. It's good that we're on email, but we need to do a lot more to keep it out there. あのその政府にあの来たあの支援してくださったお金というものはなかなか私たちが本当に知ることができない部分があるんですけれども、例えばその今アイリンさんにあのボビーさんが送られたようにあの個人から個人それから小さい団体から小さい団体へそういうところに送られているお金もあのあります。でそういうものはその確実に受け取ったところがあの有効に使うことができるというふうに思います。コミュニティに対してですね、あのやったんですけども、石中自社やなんかにこう大きい団体にね、そういう資金がこうどういうふうに実践力を高めるのか。I think the best way to ask the Red Cross in Japan. Red Cross. 
would like to close the symposium with P Professor Norma Field's remarks, and then, um, you know, because of her enthusiasm and caring and sincerity and all those things brought these wonderful guest speakers to get, get together here. Um, <laughs> And they are, they are the most wanted people in their field. So uh, thank you very much. I, I, I can see from your faces how tired you are. <laughs> and at the same time, you're still here, which is astonishing to me. And a part of me is reluctant for us to disperse from this room, you know, on this day when we have this fragile, fragile moment of no reactors operating in Japan. It's such a fragile moment, and somehow being together makes it seem a little bit less fragile. And so what I mean by that is that um, most of my time when I deal with these issues in the University of Chicago, I am very conscious of being in a very stark minority. Um, sometimes students say, you should go talk to our po political science professors, you'd have a really good argument. And I'm thinking, yeah, that would be really profitable <laughs> for both of us. And, and what I want to say, and, and we've heard of I mean, radiophobia or the, um, the rejection that people in Fukushima who worry about their children's well-being being scorned, not necessarily because the scorner is so secure, but precisely because the scorner is insecure. That kind of, um, all those ways in which we are subjected to derision and disbelief, um, I'm, I have, I cannot imagine Mr. Koida's stamina and courage to pursue what he has for 42 years, to occupy that kind of position or Ms. Muto's um, similar kind of courage exercised in a different field. And, and the kind of generosity also that she pointed to us as an example that don't hate the person who's, um, who seems opposed to you. Don't make the wrong enemy, right? Look at the forces, the structures that divide us. So I want, to, I want us all to take away these extraordinary models of courage. I'm sure that's true for all the other panelists too, that they've had to face derision uh, many, many times in their lives, disbelief from their peers. Um, so that courage and the, gen the generous intelligence not to identify your enemy incorrectly, because we don't get anywhere doing that. Um, but I do think we also have to remember this moment, this fragile moment we're sharing, and to extend our support and affirmation to each other, also to, to help people who are struggling to voice a view that is not well received. So I feel the academy is, is an almost entirely hostile place to affirming human values that is considered sentimental and unintellectual. And it's very, very hard to, um, to gain intellectual respect if you have as your ultimate value respect and dignity and the well-being of all human beings. I think scholars have been extremely unimaginative and lazy in understanding how that too is an intellectual project. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much for being here. Let's not forget this very precious day we had together with such, um, at such expense, such effort on the part of our guests from far and near away and a kind of um, emotional fatigue and, and burden that they've generously given us to. And I wish you all good health and good comrade, comrades wherever you turn. Thank you very much.